recording here. <laughs> Awesome. Um, so good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to our integrated crop livestock systems virtual field day. My name is Emily, and I am the engagement coordinator with Farm Folk City Folk. Um, and I recognize quite a few of the names uh, on this call. So thank you for continuing to attend uh, these online events. I'm sure the Zoom calls are starting to feel quite draining for everyone. So um, I, I really appreciate the, the folks who have come back uh, to be here with us. And if you're new here, then welcome to our um, to our, one of our virtual field days. Um, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that the lands that the filming for this field day took place on is the unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, the traditional territory of the Cowichan tribes. And I am calling in this evening from the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and tsleil nations. And I'd just like to take a moment to reflect on our work at Farm Folk City Folk, specifically through our Climate Solutions Program. We promote a lot of farming practices that um, are considered to be sustainable and climate friendly, things like cover cropping and reduced tillage, mixed farming systems, which is the topic for this evening. Um, but I just want to note that um, all of these things that we talk about, they're not new ideas and that um, Indigenous peoples have been stewarding and farming land in BC for a long, long time and um, using a lot of these ecologically mindful practices that we're talking about. Um, and Indigenous communities have been protecting this land since time immemorial. And I invite you all to consider how we can support Indigenous communities in food production and food sovereignty efforts. And um, I'm sure we have people joining us today from across BC. So I also invite you to acknowledge in your own way, the traditional caretakers of the lands that you are currently on uh, and learn more about how the land was traditionally and still is used by indigenous communities. This uh, event tonight is hosted by Farm Folk City Folk, BC's oldest and largest food and agriculture nonprofit, where we work to connect, empower, and inspire people to strengthen BC's food systems. And we do that through a variety of programs like this Climate Solutions Program, which is uh, what this virtual field day is a part of. And uh, Koei Taylor, our communications coordinator at Farm Folk City Folk, is also here with us to help out. Um, if you're, <laughs> hey Koei, <laughs> thanks. Um, if you're having any troubles with Zoom or uh, have any non-farming related questions, feel free to pop them in the chat and Koei can uh, hopefully help you out with that. Um, and then we'll keep the, the farming related questions for Delisa. Uh, and speaking of, we are joined by Delisa Lewis, a lead farmer at Green Fire Farm. Delisa helped create and was lead instructor for the new farmer, new farmer training program at the UBC farm for a few years. She's an assistant professor and teaches three courses in land and food systems at UBC each winter, mentors new farmers through young agrarians and other networks and trains the green fire farm field crew each year. Uh, she's engaged in research collaborations focused on soil health and nutrient management, um, she sits on the accreditation board of the Certified Organic Association of BC uh, and is sought after as a speaker at farming conferences and events in the off season. Uh, and she was honored in 2020 with the Brad Reed Award for her leadership and service to the community of organic growers in BC. So welcome, Delisa. Thanks for joining us. Um, and if do you want to add anything or pop on and say anything before we begin? Um, I think thankfulness is where I would like to just pop in and say something. I'm really thankful to Farm Folk City Folk and you, Emily, for the time and the care that you <laughs> took first with the land acknowledgement here today and then with uh, coming to the farm and um, <laughs> spending those hours in the filming, I guess. Um, and I was in great hands. I will also just say to the very um, exciting group of participants here that, that this was done in the about the third week of August, right? And so um, I just need a little caveat for how exhausted <laughs> I was at the time of this filming and um, with apologies uh, and of course understanding, I guess, from I see Art there in the, in the audience. I mean, he's going to relate to the wild hand gestures, I know. So um, anyway, just bear with me and um, we'll, we'll get to your 
questions, which will be the most important part of this learning exchange tonight, your questions and the, the discussion. That's uh, what I'm looking forward to. Awesome. Uh, okay, I'm just going to, so hopefully um, everybody is on speaker mode. If you missed that part of it, it would be great if you could click view in the top right corner and um, just throw your Zoom onto speaker mode. Um, just It's just gonna help everybody see the video more clearly. So um, I'm gonna throw this on and then, sorry, I'm just talking to myself as I do it. Um, there we go. Okay. So everybody should be able to see the first part of the video where it says integrated crop livestock systems, um, virtual field day. And if you don't see that, please let us know ASAP and we can try and figure it out for you. Um, the pre recorded farm tour is about 45 minutes long. Um, we aren't going to show it all at once. We're going to be kind of showing it in sections and then taking breaks for QA. Um, because we aren't gathering on the farm, we wanted to give everyone on the call a chance to, to see some of the farm and have like a visual of some of the things we're going to be discussing this evening. So I've tried to keep each portion short and have more time for questions and discussion. Um, as Delisa said, that's going to be kind of the most important part. So, um, but broadly, the footage will go over uh, an introduction to the farm, sort of how they got started. Um, uh, in their vegetable production, and then sort of the evolution of the livestock management, and then how those two are integrated on the farm. And then lastly, there's just going to be a little bit of reflection on challenges and uh, plans for the future. So um, yeah, so I guess with, with that, I will play the first part of the video for you all. Green Fire Farm. It's a 40 acre diverse family owned farm. Um, and I start with the diversity because the diversity is what, um, well, primarily we value that most as a family and as stewards of this land, of this 40 acre site. That diversity um, is what mm, helps us hold some balance with all the other mm, creatures and uh, the traditions, the history that was here before us. So that's important to us. I mean, we came to this farm, my partner and I, as uh, two people who just finished their PhDs. Um, <laughs> mine was in soils and agroecology and hers in resource management and reconciliation. And so we had um, some ideas of our own and an academic background. I also had 15 or some odd years of farming before we came, uh, commercial organic vegetable farming. Um, so um, with all that mixed bag of experience, you know, some knowledge, there's so many things that um, I still didn't know how to do, still hadn't tried, particularly you know, even with specialized organic vegetable farming for that long, um, I hadn't really tackled the, the sort of holy grail in organic nutrient management of how to set up and design a system for, you know, at least working towards on-farm nutrient cycling in the way that's possible with bringing in livestock and perennials. And so with coupled with that background in soils, you know, my goal was to create um, a, a system that worked as closely as possible with the soils, texture, the drainage, all the characteristics and properties of a given soil that I would have studied intently on the map before we came here. So I was very excited to get started. Um, but of course, <laughs> Farming is a humbling, humbling experience, all learning by doing, that's, uh, that's the way it happens. And so our very first year, we didn't have the, the water that we needed to begin vegetable farming. There was, a, there is a, a shallow well with not enough um, pressure to, to push itself across this 12 acre vegetable field that we had envisioned. So we 
uh, got started right away with pigs, a small herd of pigs. And um, also were able to cut hay and do hay our very first year of farming because that's what was here, basically, the hay. Um, the pigs um, are feasible for lots of folks on a small farming operation. If you can find the wieners, they're feasible as there's multiple sources of feed. Um, they're pretty hardy, so a good sort of starter piece of livestock. And right away with that small herd of pigs, 10 pigs, we were able to get our um, VC assessment. We became uh, very quickly in order with the farm status goal, which is a part of kind of what a lot of landowners are working towards, gaining that farm status. Um, <laughs> um, like for this year, really, truly the, the key challenges is the water and the heat together, like limited water and excessive, excessive heat. And so if we were just doing, you know, without the livestock, without the perennials, um, just with the crops, um, just with the vegetable crops, um, I feel like uh, our systems, you know, I'll say this first, most of our farm water, most of the water from the irrigation pond does go into the vegetables. We make that decision because the vegetables drive the cash flow of the farm and uh, feed so many people. The vegetables really are what we have to feed the people of Vancouver Island. Um, the livestock is at a scale that is a match with our limited knowledge and skills and with the limited water resources and um, infrastructure that it takes to build over time. Um, I'll say that this piece about diversity and um, adapting to the climate, a diverse farming system is necessarily knowledge intensive. And so each piece of that puzzle, you need to be so ready to adapt or in other words, change <laughs> literally within, you know, I, ideally you've prevented your, um, your crisis, your, your, um, your crop loss, your livestock loss by designing a system that is a good match for, uh, let's say, a worst case scenario. What is the 10 year? What is the 50 year? And, you know, doing a little bit of that homework, you can learn about the climate normals, so to speak, over a 30 year period. But I don't think anything can prepare you for um, some of the disasters that we've seen this year in terms of wildfires, this extensive drought, you know, I, I think the only thing that we have going for us on that front is just really trying to keep the systems modest and within our own limited knowledge and skills. So not growing the herd of cattle beyond what we can very carefully manage, making sure that all the needs are met. Uh, same with the um, same with the small flock of sheep. Like we're keeping those numbers low because of our very best guess of what we can um, take care of very well, both in good times and in bad, in crisis times. So we, <laughs> there's less than 20 minute drive away, people have had to evacuate their horses and other livestock. Like this is just within a week. So <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure what else to say about that <laughs> other than keep it small uh, to, or at least keep it sized to match the resources that you have, both in terms of your capacity to manage it, your your capital, all of your trucks and trailers and all that real hard infrastructure stuff. Mm -hmm. That's really important. And I guess the other, um, the, the piece of this that's just so human are your human networks, your neighbors, your friends, the people within, you know, the, the people you bought the animals from or the suppliers, all of those people you'll be relying on in that time of crisis in order to just take care of uh, all the animals, right? We're, we're all going to have to bring this together, particularly on Vancouver Island, particularly in this, in these small, um, more or less what will be cut off community. 
Awesome. So welcome back and hopefully it's not too awkward to watch yourself to Lisa talking on video. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that was our first portion of the video, just like a quick introduction to the farm, um, to Delisa. So does anyone have any questions? Um, I don't anticipate we'll spend too much time right now with questions just because that was just sort of a quick introduction video, but um, maybe if you have any questions about um, Delisa's background, the farm, um, she touched on a little bit of climate impacts. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat or you can unmute yourself. There's not too many of us, so I think if we just, you can feel free to ask questions um, yourself as well. <laughs> Maybe um, if you don't mind, I just have a quick question uh, because I think we, you and I talked about this, but I, it didn't make it in the recording. So um, how did you end up on Vancouver Island? Like why did you choose Vancouver Island for a specific reason or how did that, how did you end up there? But I think that pops us right back to the, the last point I was making in terms of your human network. It was a very personal decision that had to do with our uh, household where we were able to manage co-parenting and, and raising uh, the two girls that we have um, in large part. But on the other on the other hand, Vancouver Island and the Cowichan Valley in particular uh, was a good choice for us in terms of cost relative to other uh, choices in the lower mainland and around, you know, we're able to be um, right in the center between the two urban marketplaces of Vancouver Island in this location. And I was certainly really attracted to the idea of the warm land, perhaps less so this year after the heat domes one, two, and three, but the warm land sounded like a good idea. <laughs> back in 2014. <laughs> nice. Um, I'll give it just another second. Does anyone have any questions that they want to quickly ask before we move on to the next video? I guess I, I do. I'm, I'm wondering if you have any other water catchment systems. You said you had an irrigation pond. Do you do any catchments in cisterns or anything like that on your farm? Um, we don't, um, partly because the, the, the amount of water that we need is, is quite large for, for the vegetables. I think we've, we've discussed some, you know, and off of the roofs of the barns, that sort of thing. We've certainly discussed it. There are definitely, every winter we think about it, but now we're into year seven. We haven't done it yet. I see someone in the audience um, who um, has some carpentry skills that we've discussed this with <laughs> specifically. Um, so who knows, you know, it is, it is something that we'd like to do. And as the water becomes more and more scarce, every every available resource is important. It's just one that um, we haven't gotten around to yet. Um, I think the one that we've discussed this year um, that hadn't been on the table before is actually trying to catch the wash water from our wash pack shed. Um, that, you know, in, in this year, the level of drought we saw this year, it seemed like wow, even that water would be a really uh, good resource to have uh, that kind of gray water. So um, I applaud all those who have every possible option of water catchment at their disposal already. But like many farm infrastructure projects, it's, it takes time to get all of those ducks in a row, so to speak. Great question though, thank you. Thank you. Awesome. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna move on to the next video, which is also a short one. Um, so there we go. Okay. Yeah. So we did start with um, um, 
a canvas that included uh, hay, a hay production. And so in our first year, we did 1,100 bales of hay as our, 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 our big initial crop. And we brought in um, 10 wiener piglets from another Vancouver Island source and raised them here on the farm. And we began the process of building the irrigation pond and the infrastructure surrounding that irrigation pond, meaning the pumps and uh, all of the irrigation pieces that run this, that drive the system for the vegetables. So we also started work uh, in that first year on a 12 acre perimeter deer fence around the vegetable crop. And so used as best we could what was here and adapted it a bit. I mean, you can see that well, this fence looked quite different when it was a horse farm. I simply took some of the, the wood posts, lifted them up, and then rolled the wire along the outside. And so, yes, 12 acres later, there's a, <laughs> there's a, there's quite the deer fence and it's, it's served us well. We're kind of standing against this wooded ridge. There's definitely been wind storms, a little bit of repairs here and there, but uh, we're into year seven with this, deer fence and um, fingers crossed that it serves us for another seven or 21 or something like this. Um, but no fence goes without repairs and maintenance. Um, so we're, we're, we try to do that in the fall and winter months. Um, into year two, we did start with the, the irrigation pond and beginning with the vegetables, uh, started with two farmers markets, uh, small CSA, and a little bit of wholesale markets. And each year after that, um, sort of did our best to grow all those uh, marketing outlets. Um, certainly last year in 2020 was a good opportunity to build the CSA back, build back the CSA with the regenerated interest in that model of buying. Um, but we still have to, Farmers markets, a CSA, and wholesale up a island to Pino Euclid down south to Victoria and into Nanaimo. Um, and the other fairly large change in the year of COVID 2020, we decided that we would change gears away from raising the wiener piglets. Um, they are. Um, of course, omnivores, and we have been building our own supply chain. I we're a certified organic farm by choice and by practice and by experience. Uh, um, so I sourced the certified organic grain for these pigs from Chilliwack uh, freight companies into Nanaimo. Picked it up with my truck and trailer. Anyway, it was a big undertaking that I knew would be very, very difficult, if not impossible during COVID. So um, we made a pivot, not just to a larger CSA, but to an all herbivore livestock farm. So we have a few horses for our teenage daughter, um, <laughs> gets her outside. Um, and uh, we also have a small herd of grass fed beef. And uh, we brought in last year, the weaned lambs or market lambs into the system. And they are all herbivores, we don't have to import the grain for any of those. Um, we have, of course, a small flock of omnivore layer hens for our household, but that's it uh, as far as the grain. And so working towards um, the best model we have, and we have this asset of a great deal of grass and forage on the 40 acres. So trying very hard and working in partnership with the environmental farm plan and a grazing management plan as a part of that sort of funding and opportunity. So last year we uh, did some riparian fencing to help us with the sheep um, and the other cattle and uh, horses and have been working on our own sort of dance with <laughs> sheep here, horses here, cows there, which pasture, when, and certainly in this 2021, this year of great drought, like we're really challenged to make sure the animals get uh, enough grass. We've done okay, but that's part of that is just keeping the animal numbers low for 
a low stocking ratio for our area in any case, just in that uh, worst case scenario, which this might have been. Hey, okay, welcome back. Um, yeah, so did, I can see actually some questions have been asked in the chat, which is awesome. And thanks to Lisa for, for answering those as we go. Um, does anyone have any questions for, for right now? Um, maybe on any of the things that Delisa touched on in that video. Or if you wanna elaborate Delisa on the, on the question of what was your first crop, I don't know, it's up to you. Hmm. I mean, I think I think I'd love to hear a question, but I have a sense that a lot of this audience already knows <laughs> the story, <laughs> which is great. <laughs> Let's talk about your crops. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. And I'm I'm also happy to just keep going through the videos. Like if people don't have, we're gonna sort of get into like the the actual operation and um, and the livestock starting now. So I feel like that'll be kind of when the discussion starts. So um, I'm happy to like move along into videos, but I just thought I'd give a quick pause in case anyone had anything they wanted to ask right now. Um, yeah, so someone's asking if the livestock are cycled through the veg areas at all. Um, you do talk about that later, but yeah, if you wanted to touch on it, you're, you're welcome to. Um, How's maybe? that? <laughs> That's great. Um, I was going to say you, you briefly touched on fencing and actually we did have a question come through in our registration um, from someone who wanted your thoughts on whether um, or what your thoughts are on electric versus permanent fencing and perhaps if you have a preference if you use both and if so in what ways so maybe you could touch on that right now. Yeah, happy to talk about that. And especially, I mean, you just saw the the sort of on the video, the, the background perimeter fencing, the deer fencing in that um, vegetable field is what I would call permanent fencing. The farm came with the infrastructure of perimeter fencing and some cross fencing. Um, and so in answer to that question, I would say we use, it's a both and. So we use that backdrop of the permanent fencing. And in addition, the riparian management plan um, funding that we got allowed us to um, add more permanent fencing in areas where we really don't wanna see the livestock just bolting down into the waterways, which they have done and they can do. <laughs> So um, the, the permanent fencing is, is more or less peace of mind, but in terms of the intensive management or the rotations with the livestock, and I'm speaking mostly about the sheep and the cows right now, um, we use a combination of electric fencing to, to move them around through the growing season and as the grass and forage availability moves and changes. So. The sheep have electric netting, and that's quite simple. I would, I love that system. Um, and we have many of these nets that we're able to move around. Um, they're relatively simple to manage. Uh, the, the cows and the pigs, uh, we used a system of electric rope fencing. Um, and and again, the, the perimeter of their area, their pasture grazing area is permanent fencing inside that area. We use the smaller areas of um, movable electric fencing. Um, and I, 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 I wouldn't want to manage the livestock without that both and of the permanent and the electric fencing. It, it definitely gives peace of mind. Um, this week, for example, <laughs> we've had several of a neighbor's livestock bolt onto our farm. We had a herd of horses here uh, when I had about 300 pounds of carrots I was washing on the table. A, wild, a gang of wild horses came barreling down the driveway. It's, it's just this time of year when people are, you know, 
the grass is, is limited, but it's there. If an animal is fenced out of something they can see or smell and they want to get somewhere else, uh, they will. So <laughs> I guess that's enough said there. <laughs> Thanks. John has his hand up. Yeah, yeah. John, do you want to unmute yourself? And Hi, Delisa. I had a question for you. Um, could you talk a little bit more about your decision process from going from pork to sheep? You talked about the um, the off island grain and shifting to having herbivores and on site and closing that that feed loop. Was that the precipitating sort of factor in that decision, or was there other either like human resource management or land impact? Um, factors that influence that decision? Yeah, the, there were enough of those other pieces that you're aware of, Aaron, that land impact. Um, um, I'm not sure, I wouldn't say that the pigs required any more human resources than the sheep, uh, aside from that um, a little bit crazy making process of going out and getting the grains. Um, so that's um, something that I don't have to do with the sheep at all. Um, and I think just in general that those two things together, the impacts of the pigs, you know, they're wonderful pioneers out in areas where the land can really uh, take that, the, their impacts, their um, I'm going to use a word that maybe not all will understand here. They're wallowing, the wallowing of the pigs. <laughs> yeah, lots of syllables, John. Um, it, deep holes um, are just difficult to avoid, regardless of, uh, I think, how intensively you rotate them. If you're on a particular soil type, we have a limited amount of soil areas that are drained enough to sort of handle the pigs out on pasture at certain times of the year. And, you know, I would say that um, although we switched to a heritage breed um, that could take um, a good deal of sun, the large blacks, the heritage large blacks were an improvement for us over the, the, the land race pigs, the white pigs that were getting sunburned out in the field. Um, the heat for the pigs is a big factor. And so we, we, we saw that they did a lot better. They were a lot more comfortable if we were able to keep them in areas that were quite shaded. And I would say that we just sort of ran out of areas, Aaron, that were just best suited for those pigs. Um, in addition to the grain, yeah. Woo, good question. Thank you so much for asking. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, I'm going to move right along here to the next video. Vegetable farming, I mean, that's, that's where I got started in farming, really. Um, as, as, a, as a young adult, um, I was lucky enough to have grandparents who farmed, they had mixed farms. Uh, and it was mostly with livestock and a kind of a two acre home garden. Um, but um, for me as a young adult, I learned uh, certified organic farming in intensive vegetable systems in Central Coast California. And so very different markets, very different realities, but it's, it's, it's been very interesting for me over the past couple of decades to see that <laughs> march of limited water and intensified systems and, in, and intensified challenges sort of work its way north here towards British Columbia. We're facing a lot of the same issues. Um, and, you know, the, the notion of rain-fed vegetable cropping is... Uh, <laughs> just that, a notion. So we're absolutely um, dependent on that irrigation piece. And um, for the for the for each rotation field, we've got four set up with a four year 
rotation, different crop families. We're looking at the bean field this year. And so this year, um, this section here with the flags has been, this is its fourth year in a, in a research project in collaboration with the Sustainable Agriculture Landscapes Lab and the UBC Farm, we've been looking at um, organic vegetable nutrient management in multiple ways from the soil health perspective. This is the tail end of a study called Too Much Too Little. And we have rotated, we've looked at um, cover crops compared with um, overwinter tarps. The tarps are gone in the summer, but each one of these plots that we're sampling now uh, in a randomized trial, we're, we're trying to look and see what the challenges, trade-offs, benefits, if any, are there from the soil health perspective of using these two techniques to, to cope with what we know are the challenges, both too much water in the winter and too little water in the spring and summer. So that's what those tools are uh, used for by a number of farmers uh, at the scale. And so uh, the hope is that we can, yeah, find out what we can and share that with regional growers. We're working in the Kootenays and here on Vancouver Island specifically and back in the lower mainland. But the, the rotations here um, move around in time and um, irrigation, and the water type, you know, beans, we're able to switch from micro sprinklers over the drip. So the, the type of irrigation is part of it. The needs of the crop are part of it. What, put, what puts the two families together. Um, and the specific characteristics of the field to a certain extent, but we do move each around um, in a four year cycle. Um, and it's meant we're, we're lucky enough to have a good deal of spatial separation that helps also with disease and pests uh, but we're certainly challenged with disease and pests like every other uh, sort of small scale vegetable farmer um, this has been I guess every year has its own sort of the year of the flea beetle that might be this one <laughs> well actually this might be the year of the geese we've been really really challenged by a family of geese and I look down to the lettuce patch and I see them there right now so I want to just like I'll, I'll try not to go crazy lady and chase them off right on camera here but I'm warning you <laughs> I'm warning them <laughs> the, the geese are a bigger problem for us in here than the deer um, <laughs> what else um yeah we do we're we're in this moment where we're waiting for that fall cover crop moment to come in we do need a little bit more moisture uh, to help because we've kind of run the water down through this drought that we might need to water that in so uh hopefully any moment now we've got until about september 15th to kind of get it all established and kicked off we do a lot of fall cover cropping we do some warm season pollinator crop and smother crops but this was not a year for that we didn't have the moisture for that um we do our best to be as diverse as possible in that model of a csa uh farm and a market farm but um there, there is a limit to what to to the numbers of crops. I used to say, well, we grow 150 crops, and that you know, we're not trying to grow every single crop for everybody. We're trying to find the crops that work best uh, again for these soils, this climate, these markets. So it's this mix of biology and uh, sociology and all these other, I don't know, uh, yeah, art, science creativity guess your best guess <laughs> i wish i could say that that the cover crop particularly the overwinter cover crops they don't always go according to plan a not even in this research uh, plot um plan a would be yes we're very carefully thinking about do we go rye do we go wheat um we want it to stay on the ground by experience we know that like for this farm, these soils, and the time that we're able to get it in, um, a, a simple rye, wheat, clover, uh, rye, vetch, clover, um, is, 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 it works. It, 
it takes hold. But the trade-off can be uh, wireworm pressure um, based on the potential inability to break that rye down in time. Um, timing is everything in the spring with the cover crops. And so I have switched over the last few years to a little bit more winter wheat, uh, experimenting with some oats. But each one of the cereal grains that we use usually at a ratio to 70 to 80 percent cereal and then 20 to 30 percent some type of legume, whether it's vetch, clover or any mix of vetch, clover, peas that we can get a hold of. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I would say that um, sometimes it's about planning and sometimes it's about the seed we can get. Like, it's been wonderful that more of the regional seed suppliers now have certified organic seed. Um, that's exciting. That helps us plan. But then again, there's just the, wow, that's taking a lot longer than I thought. And we're going to have to use rye reality. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes, yeah. sometimes we just get a reality because we don't want to leave the ground uncovered but that's kind of where those overwinter tarps come in and I think that there are a lot of farmers that are using them strategically when they've got a late crop and able to you know follow that good soil health rule of keeping some kind of cover on the ground if you can't keep a living root in the ground or can't keep it covered through cover crops switching to that overwinter tarp will at least um, reduce some of that structural damage from the heavy rain. It's been interesting to see how that goes. While I don't love seeing a field covered in plastic or those silage tarps, it is one of those trade-offs and a tool that works at certain scales and in certain circumstances. It can work well. Mm -hmm. cool. Hey. Awesome. I see some um, some questions in the chat. Does anyone have any questions at this point? Yeah, feel free to unmute yourself or raise your hand or just pop it in the chat and I can ask it, whatever you're most comfortable with. Um, Lisa, one of the questions that came in um, sort of in the registration, uh, and I can see someone is asking about your soil type. Um, so maybe I'll ask this question as well, because I think it goes really nicely with it, is um, just do you do any soil testing on your crop fields? Um, and what does that look like? And how often? Um, what sorts of like results do you typically get? And how do you how does that change your approach in terms of like amending and planting and things like that? Mm, that's a great question. And um, I think in the last, maybe it was the segment before last, we were looking at the beans field, the research field there. And um, I also mentioned my background in, in, in soils and in particular um, nutrient management in soils. That long-term research project that we're looking at is specifically um, trying to gain insight on nutrient cycling. So the soil testing that we do on the farm uh, is very intensive in that research plot section and um, stepping back as just a grower, a person who practices um, certified organic farming in vegetables on soils that we know to have certain limitations. Um, my soil testing sort of routine in the other areas of the soil outside of research are um, a yearly testing. I sample in the spring and, and send those samples off to a lab that I trust. This one uh, happens to be one that I worked with as a grad student um, in the Lower Mainland. Um, and I look at uh, those analyses both um, in real time in the year that they come and then I'm able to also look at the soil analysis results over time and see 
uh, some small changes and progressions. Um, our soils are uh, very, for, for the annual, for the cultivated annual vegetables, the main amendments that I have made in response to those soil test results have been to add lime. We also add sources of uh, phosphorus and um, some nitrogen um, and some sources of potassium. So these are um, inputs that fit within an, um, an organically managed system. They're a match to the, the sort of nutrients that are shown to be lacking for the crops that are grown for the, I'll just stop right there and take a breath. Are there other questions about that? Because I can, I'd also love to talk about the pasture piece and the more aspirational soil management there, but other questions? I can see a question came in from Lisa, uh, wondering about possibilities of cover crops that animals can also graze. And if you have any recommendations. Well, that uh, that is the holy grail that I'm looking forward to, to, to trialing. It's the terminating cover crops with the sheep. And um, I think that um, it's basically the, the sheep are hardy enough to graze through any of those um, cereal legume mixes that I mentioned in the previous slide. I will be looking to, there's, there's a good deal of research out of Montana State and other places focused on, um, actually I saw some from France as well, where they're using sheep to terminate cover crops. So I'll be continuing to do more research about which ones, but um, I, I think with ruminants, the, the important piece is just to make sure that you're not putting in any uh, legumes that are causing, I don't know, alkaloids are an issue. We have lupins in our field as a sort of a persistent weed problem. They are in the legume family. So um, that's not a cover crop, but the sheep for, for the most part, sheep and cows will avoid plants that are toxic to them. Uh, but in the case of an intentional grazing with cover crops and terminating that, you really want to, you do want to choose the best, um, the best species for that, for the sheep, but also for, for gaining that greatest amount of cover on the soil. So unless I find out otherwise, I would keep to that same uh, mix that I mentioned, which is basically just a, a heavy, uh, dominantly cereal, and then um, likely a peas or clover mix for the sheep. Does that answer that question? Yeah, uh, I think so. Um, and John has a question as well. Um, do you incorporate cured animal manure into your composting system? Well, this is the time of year that um, I'm pulling about a wheelbarrow to two wheelbarrows every day out of the um, the cow shed, for example, that that John helped to build, um, <laughs> and that isn't cured manure. Uh, that's that manure goes right into the pile, um, and that pile is used. That's I would call that an aged and aging an aged manure pile because we don't um, regularly test and monitor that pile in the way that would need to be done for the certified organic um, regulations. That pile will be called an aged manure pile even when it's two years old, three years old. My practice is to uh, take that pile that grows through the winter and shrinks in the summer, I split that out after the end of the winter turn, incorporate again after the winter and take the core out and use those um, well composted parts of the pile. It, it ends up being roughly two, two yards of compost or aged manure technically, again, have to keep calling it that. That I use in the perennial systems and um, to date, I haven't used any of our um, uh, aged manure in the vegetable systems. Is that, that's, that's what you're asking really, John, right? Do I use it in the vegetable system? Yeah. yeah. 
Awesome, thanks. Um, I'm going to just continue to move along. So if uh, if any questions come up for anyone, yeah, feel free to just keep throwing them in the chat or um, if you can remember them, uh, you can just hang on to them and um, and we can, uh, you can ask them at the next break. Okay, so this, that's still on, okay? Yeah, so cheap. <laughs> yeah, they, um, they're, it's interesting. It was interesting to me to learn these, these actually came from a very close neighbor. Um, he, it's, a, it's a hair sheep, a Saint Croix and Katahdin mix. Mm -hmm. And the reason we chose these specifically, stop. <laughs> Is um, again, we're we just started last year, very green. So in searching for the best breed for of livestock, um, you're looking for something that's a match for your site. But also, again, it kind of goes back to your experience. And you know these these are uh, a hair sheep. They're low. They're known to be um, less troublesome with parasites. And you know, just some of the, some of the challenges that really can dog, well, you kind of get people who raise sheep. But the other thing is just, just simplified system because they, you know, we're not dealing with the wool plus the meat. We're just selling the meat. We're mm -hmm. just raising them there. And we also went even more simple and, and sort of requesting, we learned from raising the pigs that the males get bigger faster. So these are all males. We get, we try to get all males from the flock. And it, it also allows you to make a simpler system in terms of your fencing. In terms of going to chew on your fence. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> in terms of everything. So we just try to keep it as simple as we can as we're getting started and then learn our way into, um, yeah, into the animals themselves. Like, uh, I guess the example I would say with the with the small herd of cows that we have, we you know we were able to find four um, yearling cows from a certified organic farm just uh, south of us in this valley, and um, with that we struck a relationship with the with the farmer you know they were very good about mentoring us in setting the systems up they were also very good about um helping us um with the sort of inevitable first year questions <laughs> you know how do they look what is this the right body condition all those things you know with um the uncertainties around whether the feed and the forage that you've got as a base, as a baseline is going to be enough. But the other is just that we had two steers and two heifers and were very hesitant to, to, to sort of move into breeding. We've been hesitant to move into any type of breeding with the livestock systems because that definitely takes you to another level. Um, but we were able to, for the first time last year, um, source a rentable so we've done <laughs> we did uh have our first on-farm calf this march which was very exciting she was it was a healthy birth and we got some experience uh with bottle feeding because it was a first time mom and it took her about three days to to sort of catch up and decide well oh this is actually a good idea. Oh, right, right, right. So it was, it was a little bit nerve wracking those first few days, but um, everything worked out fine. Healthy baby, healthy mom. And uh, again, you're just, as we're learning our way into each one of these uh, systems with all herbivores um, around the farm, uh, we're very careful not to, to take on that breeding aspect, um, but it is something that, um, the, the selection of the breed, just like with the vegetables. I mean, I spend 
so much time building relationship with the seed suppliers and with specific cultivars that will work in our slots on the vegetables. The same energy and focus has to be spent on the livestock with respect to the right breed for your, you know, with sheep, um, how wet the soil, how wet the grass. Um, that's where a lot of the diseases and other issues come in. And so um, we did put a lot of thought into that choice. Mm -hmm. The relationships are so important with all the animals. And so at this point we have two uh, companion boarded horses. And so the horses are cost neutral um, and that's, uh, that's quite a good thing. The, <laughs> the, the horses rotate in the pastures, uh, but specific pastures, we do sort of keep the horses on one side of the farm and the, the cows and the sheep on the other, the, the ruminant side and the non-ruminant side. But, but, um, yeah, part of that has to do with the organic certification, um, and just the different needs of the horses through the seasons. You know, we, we're lucky to have this extensive sheep netting. And, you know, uh, I think it, it depends on the season. Like right now we're standing in, in some grass. It looks like they're finding a little bit of green down in this tall. This is the, the hay that we didn't cut. This is a rough edge, but it's a shaded edge. That's uh, the best we can give them at this time. Um, again, heat dome one, two, three we're not able to irrigate this part of the farm. So I would say we rotate them where we move their mobile shed, it probably adds ah, once a week. Um, it can be three days. It depends on uh, how wet it is, what the conditions are. But on average, we're moving that once a week and we're opening up a new section of grass for them once a week, something like this. So this sheet net is quite easy to move and open. And uh, if we were, I guess I would say that one of the lessons from the mentors who uh, sold us the, the, the cows to begin with, they're rotating them every day uh, or at least opening up a new section every day. And that managed intensive grazing. Um, if the livestock was the only thing I was doing on the farm, absolutely, I would give them much less space and much less time that mob grazing it's a it's it's a great way to do it for us i would say this is a modified system that sort of balances out the reality that i don't have time to do it every day or labor to to make it happen every day but we're we know we're ready in about a week's time <laughs> to, to make it happen so we do build that time in to, to open up a new section and um try to make it it, you know, they'll show you what's happening. You can see what's happening on the ground. It's it's quite stark in the spring. This difference between um, the the green and the and the grays. Making you sure you're starting with something quite healthy is really key. That's really key. That's been the thing that's helped us. Because otherwise, you know, again, this um, this is the part of the farm that's quite a bit less intensive. Doesn't get I'm out here once a day, maybe more in the summer, but not much more than once in a day. I'm checking the water and making sure they're in and comfortable and you know that they're they they're safe. But they don't need much of me as long as they've got a big a big area, shade, water, feed, um, and each other, right? But yeah. Rosie will tell me about it if something else is up. <laughs> Rosie's gonna tell me. Okay, um, welcome back and I hope that like more raw footage was okay to watch. It was uh, tough with the animals in there. They were a very friendly bunch. So um, <laughs> it was a bit shaky at times. Um, so I can see some questions have come into the chat. So maybe I will, unless anyone wants to ask any right, right now, um, I, can, I can just kind of go through what's been asked in here. Um, Teresa was asking if you'd be able to share who your soil testing lab is. Um, Pacific Soil Analysis in uh, Richmond. 
And um, Lisa was wondering, are you following different species after each each other, like cows followed by birds after a certain number of days to help control parasites, eggs and such? Um, any rules of thumb? Um, yeah, I started to write an answer, but it's probably easier if I just, yeah, answer this way. Um, we are not um, set up to do the Joel Salatin chickens after cows uh, to any kind, in any kind of formal way. Our very small flock of sort of household chickens is what we sometimes call radically free ranged. And so whether it's the horses or the cows that are in the near pasture system or the sheep. So at many times of the year, we have animals that are close to the chickens um, and the chickens definitely will uh, get after the manure piles and enjoy it very much. But because of the raptor pressure on our farm, we have not set up systems to put the chickens out in the fields where there's really not enough. Um, we have a good riparian zone and a strong stand of dug firs even with that, our free range chickens sometimes are victims of the, the raptors, the eagles and the hawks. We, we actually lost one just a couple of weeks ago. This, the shoulder seasons are terrible for uh, the, the chickens. So uh, no, we haven't done that. And it's a great system. It, it's just, it just requires more infrastructure, more built infrastructure. Um, and more shelters in pastures. I can recommend uh, a person who happens to be one of the participants here, uh, I believe his name is John Rosinski. He's been a big part of helping us build the mobile sheep shelters and, and other shelters for the cows. Just a shout out to John right now because he is your, what do we call him? A farm pinter. Thank you, John. <laughs> awesome. Um, thanks. And I think, yeah, I think also you elaborate that on that a little bit more in the, uh, the next video as well. And we talk, talk more about the integration aspect of it. Um, Rod is asking, is there a limit on the number of sheep or cows that farmers are allowed to have on their land in BC? Um, and then there's a secondary question. Oh, I'll let you answer that one first, and then we can go to the next one. <laughs> I don't, I don't have the most accurate answer for that one. And I'm wondering if Art is still on the call and can recall uh, anything. I don't believe there is. Art, are you still around? Yeah, <clears throat> the only uh, limits would be in the interior where you've got rangeland and uh, you're allowed so many animal unit months to graze. But if it's private land, it's kind of you know, maybe it's up to your organic certifier or your SPCA certifier or whatever, but um, yeah. Thank you, Art. I mean, it does need to be in line with, um, yeah, the animal units with the amount of land, but I think we know from uh, some challenged manure management in the Fraser Valley that those aren't always a, a, a perfect match. So I think it's, largely a voluntary system. I, I, I'm not certain, although regulations are said to be coming in very specifically tied to nutrient management and nutrient management planning. Any other thoughts on that, Art? Yeah, well, <clears throat> definitely there's uh, the lower mainland and North Okanagan, and then there's everybody else. And all the intensive livestock down there has resulted in way too much manure and too much phosphorus, too much nitrogen. Um, you know, operation like yours is a long way from that. It's got more to do with the carrying capacity and for, for feed and costs and so on. Thank you. Thanks, Art. I should say too, yeah, like where, um, as we go through these questions, like if anyone else has input or has like the answer to something or um, experience, like feel free to, to weigh in as well. Um, the, the secondary question to that was, is there a government website that specifies the limits and or the required facilities bylaw um, to have on the farm based on the size of farmers herd? So looking for resources, it looks like, if anyone knows of any. Um, 
I would say that um, if you're looking on the web sites and web pages where the environmental farm plan uh, literature is, um, we filed a grazing management plan. The guidelines and rules of thumbs are there and with the nutrient management branch of the Ministry of Agriculture, it's likely that there will be linked pages there um, to this. In somewhere between grazing management and nutrient management, um, I think you'll find what you're looking for, Rod, and thank you so much for the questions. Thanks. Um, and then uh, Sarah has a question. How long do you raise your sheep? Uh, how old are they when you, when you get them? Um, so we have two years with the sheep and um, it's, it's very interesting to me how similar their, their cycle, their growth cycle is to the pigs if you're buying them as weaned animals. Um, so we buy them in um, late March, early April and slaughter in late September. And that was true for the pigs as well. Thanks. Um, there's a question here from Natasha about if you integrate your livestock in your food plant growing areas. I know you sort of get into that into the next uh, video. So maybe we could hold off on that question. I, but I do see it. I just want to acknowledge that I do see it, Natasha, but maybe we'll hold off on that one until um, after the next video. Um, and Julia is wondering, uh, with your electric netting fence, do you use solar? And if so, what kind of system or is it hardwired in? Um, the farm came with some solar panel battery chargers. They um, worked okay for the horses with a very low voltage at large area and a simple setup. Um, but I learned within, by year two with the pigs, we learned that we needed a higher voltage um, you know, a better, a stronger system that was more mobile than the sort of single large pasture solar panel chargers. Um, and I wasn't able to get a fix on those solar panels, even though I replaced the battery. So sometimes you just have to go and buy a new charger. So we haven't used solar panels to trickle and recharge the batteries we use. I use a simple battery recharger setup. Um, in the barns. It's something that works, would work really well for remote systems where you need, where a low charge is all you need. But I need, uh, particularly when it's a new fencing system or a new rotation, I wanna have a good strong charge to start. So uh, over the past, the past five years, I've relied on, um, uh, it's a sort of dance with about five very large marine batteries and I move these around the farm to different charging stations with different uh yeah different uh different setups around the farm I think I have six yeah six six to eight places where I move that charger and the the battery and and the whole setup it's it's pretty mobile hmm. Thanks. Um, and uh, John, I see your question and I've read it. I'm not sure I understand it. Maybe you just want to jump on and ask if you're comfortable doing that. Hey, Delisa. Um, I'm wondering about holistic management training. Uh, is that something you've ever indulged yourself in, researched, or would a farmer that wanted to take on a small herd, like equivalent to your operation, say, like, do you think? taking that training would be beneficial? Um, thanks for that question, John. I think we talked about this a little bit in the winter. Um, I haven't had any direct experience with holistic management training other than sharing a workshop uh, sort of stage of presenters with, with some presenters who had that experience and spoke to it in sessions. So I haven't had the training. I, so can't recommend or not recommend that. Um, I think there are a lot of resources and because I know the amount of experience you've also already had, I would say that there are workarounds, but if it's a, an interest, like 
a specific systems design interest or philosophy, something to guide the setup and design of your own system, then I would say jump in. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, and I see a comment here from Sarah. Thanks for thanks for mentioning that. Delisa, could I ask uh, a supplementary question to that? Yeah. One of the things that I failed at at UBC was to get us to hire an animal integrator. That is someone who could work with farms like yours with the idea of integrating various classes of livestock with vegetables or grains or whatever. Uh, does that person exist anywhere in British Columbia at this, at this point? Do we have anybody in, in the ministry in Agriculture Canada, any of the universities, or is that still a need in terms of extension and, and research? I don't have the answer to that, Art, but I did, you know, as a part of preparing for this and just looking at the integrated crop livestock um, literature in general, I certainly had a chance to see what the Agriculture Agri-Food Canada research in integrated crop livestock systems, where those are coming from right now and up until up to 2030, it looked like, no, 2023. Saskatchewan, Quebec, Manitoba are the only places where that is happening and funding funded by that group. So I think that might um, answer a little bit uh, of that question. But um, if anybody else, did anybody else jump on with some ideas or thoughts, people who do have those resources? I don't see any, but uh, but maybe people could give it a thought. And um, after in our next break, if there's maybe some comments, I'll trickle in. So I'm just gonna. I I mean I think we're just um, piecing it together, Art, with the the systems and suppliers. And in and in our case, for example, it really was about going to the people that we purchased the animals from for that initial mentoring but for the long term i do believe that there there are so many areas um particularly in the mixed system that will require some uh deeper dives in terms of disease pressures you know the soil issues not just the nutrient cycling but truly looking at the you know the physical we're all very um concerned about i think one of the fears and one of the realities is compaction and other li unwanted livestock impacts and aaron alluded to that earlier um, so these are all great questions and i would love to see it get more resources thanks farm folks city folks for opening up the conversation <laughs> yeah hopefully we can um Push, push government to uh, offer more services. It's definitely lacking. <laughs> um, okay, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna jump into the next video here. This one is, I think the, the longest one, but it's you know, around 10 minutes, so bear with me. Uh, it's it's integrated, but it's over time and over seasons. People think that it's like it's not always real time. This in the summer months when they're on pasture, their manure stays here. I use uh, a very simple chain harrow and a few pieces of equipment to incorporate it. But again, during this drought and this this weather situation, I'm not doing I'm not touching this until we get some uh, some rain and some moisture in which I can cut the tops off this basically manage the forage but also manage their manure in the pastures in the pasture rotation this pasture is roughly cut into four through the four through the months of summer and, and low to no rain in the winter we've got a little uh, shelter for them up at the barn uh, right to the side here 
And when they're in that shelter, a good deal of the winter, that's, that is when I, I clean out their shelter. I do gather their manure over the winter and that goes into our compost pile. So the vegetables in the summer make up the majority of that pile. And then we're lucky to get a big influx of their, their manure over the winter. So it's a nice mix. And that, uh, that compost, most of that, that goes on to our perennial crop. So into that field I call the pie field. So um, whether it's the, the apples or the pears or the plums or um, any of it, this is scaled not to the, not to the extent that we, could, we can't use this one-to-one uh, -one in the vegetable field, but it works well at the scale we're at with the perennials. It also works better with respect to um, the food safety, the organic certification, and the timing and attention and labor that's needed to, to sort of really watch over any potential pathogens in the nutrients. So our manure that's gathered over the winter ages over time rather than me putting in more labor or more... Uh, fuel uh, with the tractor or turners to, to, to sort of get it to where it would need to be if we were going to use it in the vegetables. So I don't uh, use any off-farm compost. Um, I do uh, soil test every year. Again, sort of my background is in soils and agroecology. We've got these on-farm research trials and nutrient management. So I have this advantage of lots of samples and analysis that, that happen as a part of the practice and the research that we do. Um, but I also, as a grower, do annual soil testing and look to see what's needed in terms of balancing those nutrients. And typically in these soils, we're uh, going to need to add lime as a source of calcium. And in doing that, that helps to balance and bring up the availability of most of the other nutrients, but we're often limited particularly on Vancouver Island, we're limited with phosphorus. So I buy a certain amount. I source fish bone meal as a source of nutrients. Um, that's kind of the key. The other one that's lacking a little bit is uh, potassium. Those other cations needed in the soil. So there's a small amount, like uh, let's say a pallet's worth of nutrients for that uh, vegetable field uh, that happens every year as far as those missing minerals and, and uh, so curious. <laughs> but um, I manage the organic matter through the cover cropping and residue management and the, those, those methods, not by adding additional manures. One day, I do hope that we'll be able to use the sheep in rotation with, with the cover crops as terminating those cover crops and making their deposits. So this is year two. I'm getting closer with that dance, but I have learned <clears throat> by experimentation, like we, we did have the pigs in the vegetable field one year, just to the side and thinking about how to truly integrate the pigs in time. There's been some really good regional research on integrating pigs in real time. But what I learned again, for a sort of lower management with the diversity of systems is that, wow, cows, pigs, the impact of the cows and the pigs in that field um, was enough to teach me right away. Oh, lightweight sheep. Let's try that. <laughs> so I'm much more excited at this point, having tested the waters a little bit with the pigs and their interest in getting out of those fences and into those vegetables. The cows, same thing. Like <laughs> just even moving the cows into that vegetable field was a bit more dramatic than I wanted it to be. So sheep <laughs> with cover crop and then through time, uh, that's how it'll likely happen in that 12 acre field. And the otherwise the integration is about um, sort of keeping the nutrients cycling in their own pastures, uh, trying to make sure there um, there's, just enough, not too much. Um, and the rotations sort of work for the vegetation that's here, but what a challenging year for that um, this year. Like I'm dreaming about being able to get the timing right with terminating cover crops and using the sheep, but it would mean a very strong delay in cropping that area beyond the 120 days 
and part of that's food safety, like a big part of that's food safety, but we're signaled as a certified organic farm, we, we have some rules and signals about food safety, but I also know that manure and water <laughs> and vegetables are, you know, that's just, that's just it. So we have hand washing and we, as a, as a big protocol for food safety, that's rule number one. But the other is just keep the manure source out and away from uh, the irrigation, out and away from those vegetables that you're going to be picking in, in real time. So we have quite a, a spatial separation from manure on the ground and any kind of growing vegetables, that kind of thing. Um, this is, um, we're a long way from having that salad tin, salad bar chickens eating after the, um, the, the cows and that sort of thing that requires another level of infrastructure and systems and uh, really a different place uh, with different raptor or no raptor pressure, let's say. Um, that would be, that's also one way to handle the parasites for the animals themselves and not just the food safety with respect to the vegetables. But I, I would say that time and space are the key tools for food safety with respect to manure and uh, water irrigation, all of that. Mm -hmm. we're, we're definitely very conscious about those two factors. Right. Um, it, it's definitely intriguing to me, like just, just as a part of our learning and doing the grazing management plan for this farm, um, I'm interested in um, this dance through time between sheep, horse, cows, and which one, where, and when. Um, but this year, particularly because it's been so dry, the spring was so short, um, one reason to do that is to really um, graze the, the, the forage in a, in a specific way. Each one of those animals has different teeth and the, the grass and grazing responds differently. The growth patterns are different. And so you can move them in time. If you've got a problem of too lush grass, definitely using them together and working with them together is an is interesting tool. This wasn't the year for me to experiment with that. I'm very interested, but um, yeah, I, I think that um, I would be more likely to put the sheep with the cows than the horses with the cows, really just because the horses um, serve a different purpose on the farm. They're um, much more about the recreation and mental health and these guys are, are, are different um, in terms of uh, what their needs are out on the ground. Like the comfort level of the horses is different in different parts of the farm. Some parts of the farm, we do have predator pressure and issues and the horses are flighty animals. We keep them close to the house and where we know there's not gonna be a, a cougar or a bear, or et cetera, passing through just so they're safe in the fences, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the cows kind of match our very, you know, we're still very new to the livestock piece. Um, only since 2018 have these uh, cows been here. And since um, 2020 have the sheep been around for us. Uh, the, like I, I think I mentioned earlier, the pigs came in, in year one in 2014. Um, so each one of, you know, we're, we're learning the different systems and how to move them around uh, one day together, essentially. <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, I, I do think that it's fascinating to me how they're, the, the teeth themselves, like it, it, what happens to the grass and the ground and all of it is just a little bit, like there's a nuance of difference. And right now it's just what happens to the ground is that it's bone dry. Sure, the, the the livestock have daily needs, sometimes multiple times a day, the horses multiple times a day. And, um, but over time, I mean, I may have mentioned this some, at some other part in this conversation, but 
I do consider the, the livestock, the forage, like growing great grass and better perennials to be a better match for the farm long term, to be a better match for my life and my family as we go into another decade. So I have to start somewhere learning what works and uh, what the needs are of each one of these systems, because I do want to be um, on the farm and out on the farm um, for the rest of my living days. And I, I feel like uh, that time that I'm spending in quite the dance between the vegetables, perennials and livestock, you know, the, with all of the systems that are new to me, I'm just like, just, I'm just a toddler. I don't know how to, how else to say that. There's so much to learn. And just getting started at a small scale was important to me. Um, but I did have a fair bit of confidence with the vegetables, like, like 25 years of, it's not that you're ever gonna learn all that you need to know even about that system, but I am, comfortable with that as a source of revenue while I learn my way into these other pieces and at least start with them as cost neutral uh, adventures. Uh, okay. Thanks for that was the, sort of the the longer of the videos. Um, um, but that kind of like broadly wraps up the integration of the livestock and the crops. I know that there's probably, you know, so much more that could be touched on um, rather than just a 10 minute video. But um, does anyone have any questions or does anyone want Delisa to go more in depth about anything that was brought up during the video? It could be from that, that clip or just like the entirety of, of it all. Feel free to jump on or write a question in the chat if there is no question i think the one that was just asked by lisa helm kind of opens up um a really important part of this and you know i don't know people are surely getting tired and i would just say any of you who have resources within your networks or know people who are doing um some of this integration have some resources please um, speak up and, and share some of that with us, whether it's a question or just something to share, that would be great. Does anyone wanna jump in? <laughs> it's a quieter group. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> Um, one of the things that um, we talked about, but again, I had to cut it just because of like the length of all of the footage, um, was just around food waste. Like you touched on it a little bit, and I think I had asked, like, how much do the animals help with food waste? And um, yeah, like, is there maybe just you could touch on that a little bit? Um, sure. I mean, I. I think that the term food waste on a, on, on a farm with livestock is, it's maybe not even the best term, but you mean like food that we didn't sell. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That would have gone into the compost, but could first go into the livestock. And that, that maybe is the, one of the better forms of, of integration. <laughs> Certainly with the pigs, we, we got so much joy with, um, you know, where I could be very unhappy with a large zucchini or a, a, a cucumber that escaped, the, the pigs were able to turn that experience around for us and make it joyful. Um, and I was similarly really happy to find out that um, the cows can tackle a large zucchini and they do so uh, with a great deal of uh, happiness. So we do um, really, feed the cattle a good deal of um, uh, crop crop residue or market leftovers. Um, they love the, the carrot tops that I've had to chop off that are too large to pack, um, that kind of thing. So it's, it's, it's been great, particularly in this season, to be able to get greens and vegetables 
you know, additional nutrients into the, the livestock that are out in the vegetable field um, because it does pick up the value of their manure and that picks up the value of the whole system and cycling. Thanks. Um, yeah, so I see a comment here from Lisa. Thanks, thanks for that. Um, and then Ray and Laura um, are just wondering how many animals are you overwintering? Hmm. Well, we have uh, three, six, and 13. Three, six, and 13 counting the chickens. So, yeah, sheep, sheep are gone. They're in the freezer. And yeah, three, just three, down to three cows uh, and three horses, plus the small flock of chickens right now. Um, considering reducing the cows by one for this overwinter um, and just go right on down to the cow calf because we had such a uh, limited harvest of hay this year with the drought, but that's still to be determined. Thanks. Does anyone, oh, I can see a question just came in. Um, are you a permanent bed system for veg, uh, no-till, reduced till at all? Um, careful tillage. Um, I really do try to reduce the tillage, but part of that is also just having enough area to, you know, we, we do have crop successions, but uh, we're not so intensive that I have to go back within the same sort of rotation field and re-till or replant um, for the most part each crop gets one bed for one year, one growing season. And um, yeah, I, with, with the, the background in soils, I definitely uh, pay attention to that soil moisture. Um, it's ability, it's probably the most, um, the biggest message I get when I go out to the tillage, do some tillage regardless of um, how itchy I am to get things going. You know, um, I have a lot of different ways of testing that before we <laughs> drive the heavy, heavy-ish, medium-sized tractor <laughs> out onto the field. But yeah, mm -hmm. we definitely use tillage in the vegetables and um, permanent beds in the perennials. I have a question. Um, well, it's not, I don't really have a fully formed question, but I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit more about the financials. You said cost neutral for you a couple of times. So is that like input costs to meet sold or is that, I guess, is someone wanting to dip toes into animals of just the fear of, of the, overall financial pressure of like capital costs and how that sort of comparative where you started out with pigs to moving to the different animals. Um, yeah, what is what is the financials of that been like? Yeah, um, great question, Erin. And I think I mentioned that the the sheep and the pigs are on a very, they're on a really similar cycle. And so as far as cash flow, which is important, that's almost the same cycle. That's 20 weeks ish, same cycle as the vegetables. But the difference with the vegetables is, you know, you might have a six to eight week delay for some of those long standing crops, but the pigs and the sheep, you put your, you put the initial money in uh, for building, you know, that the, neither one of those need extensive infrastructure but some so you need some amount of infrastructure that will carry over year to year um let's say i'll just say my investments were um on the order mm, under a thousand dollars for pigs um in year two i spent a little bit more than that on the sheep um for a mobile shelter uh and infrastructure but under a thousand dollars for the pigs um but the pigs themselves, I knew that I wanted to size up enough to be able to get, basically I want the, the, the 
extended friends and family who buy the pigs out of a, a 10 pig flock. I want to be able to make enough money to get paid for any of my labor or any labor I have, um, have to pay somebody else that's working for me. Um, in addition to the cost of the feed, in addition to the cost of uh, the slaughter and cut and wrap. And so we're able to do that with the pigs. Um, and that's what I mean by cost neutral. Um, but some years are better than others. And in some years, we only made enough to, um, I would say my payment came in the form of pork if we went under that number of 10, 15, 10 to 15 was a sweet spot in terms of the numbers of pigs. We started with a, uh, the number 10 on the sheep, just trying to think that that would work the same, but the sheep are much smaller than the pigs. And so I'd say for the sheep, we're only getting paid in meat so far we haven't made enough to get paid for paid for all the labor plus the meat yet i think the numbers need to be higher simply because the sheep are so light right one whole sheep is equivalent to um one half side of our pigs if that helps with that um but then the sheep you don't have the cost of the certified organic feed every month. I would buy a, a mega tote of that. And so the sheep first cost early in the season, it's just like buying seeds. You buy those wiener sheep or the weaned sheep and have your basic, basic infrastructure. And there's not a whole lot of other cost until it comes time for the licensed slaughter. The, the cows are on a totally different timeline. That is very slow, slow money, but very much lower labor and other input costs as well. So that, you know, the diversity that we've been talking about on theme here, like having more than one livestock system, it's, it's also that thing of managing your finances where the vegetables, you're used to this really fast turnaround relatively, fast turnaround with some cash flow. Um, the pigs and the sheep are a little bit slower, but still somewhat in line. You're getting that payment by the end of the season. The cows could be year two, could be year three, or more in the case of a heifer that you're, you're working with a cow-calf system like that. And so very slow return, but very much less intense labor and management complexity. I see with the cows compared to the others that are happening in that one season. Does that answer your question? Thanks for it. <laughs> um, awesome, thanks for, for all the great questions. I see a couple more. I'm just gonna um, move into, because we just have one more video to show and I just wanna make sure that we um, are able to show it. And so maybe I'll do that now and then we can just save like the rest of the time for, for any last questions. Um, or Delisa, if you want to answer them right in the chat, that's great too. Um, and I was also, I'm just wondering, are you able to put the name or like type the name of the um, soil testing lab that you use into the chat just in case anyone missed it and then it's like right there in writing as well. Um, and I will just get the next video going. I think there's a there are a lot of constant battles and and this year the theme of those battles is I, I think I've said it each of these a number of times um the limited water for all of the systems for all that we want to keep alive on the farm including ourselves during the <laughs> gosh just Saturday's harvest we had a power outage and all of our water systems are tied to having power, electric power. Um, and the, so the water went down in the house, but the water went down in the irrigation. And um, let me tell you, my stomach just sinks when if we, we've had so much stress with respect to um, the irrigation working and working when we need it to work. And um, <laughs> it's, it's something that um, you, 
really do need to carefully consider the, the limits of water in whatever systems, whether you're trying to do integrated crop livestock or just vegetables or just livestock, any of it uh, completely uh, hinges on that living water system. Um, the other, of course, you touched on it with your question of time and how do you get downtime, but it's that's about you know, whether you call it labor or human resources or whatever it is, the, the, that piece of, um, you know, learning not to stretch yourself or your family or your friends or your resources sort of beyond <laughs> what they need to be, like really understanding what those limits are. Can you ever understand that? That's, that's difficult, but it is a part of like the gift of farming is this gift of learning into yourself, learning into others, learning into your community, um, maybe learning to be human in a way that, um, I don't know, it's a bit of, a, bit of a cliche, but all of that pivots around how much time and energy do I have in this life and how much is going to be this farm? Are you a part of that system or is that system running over you? <laughs> It can be both. It can feel like both at certain times of the year. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So that's water, time, energy. <laughs> Those are pretty big. The other thing is that the I don't want to underemphasize how challenging it is to have all these different things going on at the same time because all of it is driven by the sunlight the vegetables are absolutely you know full full speed ahead from march uh, to the equinox right it's just there's n they just take all of you but all of the so the market lambs they're also growing during that that time period as well so the needs are pretty strong uh, of each system, perennials, livestock, vegetables in the spring. And then at each shoulder point in the season, I mean, really, um, you, you kind of think you're into a routine and a rhythm and then it starts to turn a hard corner. I'm noticing this, you know, with the grass really changing. Um, we're just about at a, at a new point with Okay, you're really, <laughs> we're just about at a new point in the season with the, with the livestock as well. Certainly the sheep are going to slaughter soon. The, these cows are, are going to come out of cycle this and we'll start feeding them hay um, and go into a new spot in the rotation and the big field rotation. There's, a, there's just, there's a lot to do with respect to management at each one of those nodes. And so I, it's, it's important to, to uh, recognize all that that takes in terms of, of focus and energy and time and capital. Uh, but one thing I really did like and wanted, like part of the, part of the intention with the livestock, not just because this particular farm is, is, is well suited, but it's also, a, a bit of an intention to pull back on the use of plastics in the vegetables as a key tool, like plastics. Well, we talked about the overwinter tarps, but also the high tunnels, all these ways that we do season extension with intensive vegetable production. They're all driven by plastics, more or less. And the livestock allows me to have a crop that's high value at a different part of the season without that plastic, right? I have uh, a premium and a different product in the winter, in the spring, and um, I don't have to just completely cover the farm in plastic. We do rely on that plastic, but just again, trying to find some balance with, with that and a balance that matches our, our own unique household and the the needs of our region the needs of vancouver island and the and the people we want to grow food and share food and sell food too this is our seventh year and um in my 25th year as a farmer so 
we're definitely in a cycle of wanting to reckon with and do some strategic planning based on what's best in terms of the soils, the, the water, the limited water, um, our limited time, family needs, all those things. So we do plan to have uh, some serious conversations through the winter months about what that balance will look like over the next three, five, seven years. And, you know, I would say that the idea in my mind when we came was that we would grow the farm through our own life stages, if we're lucky enough to hand it off to our <laughs> daughters or whatever, a land trust, whatever that is, we want to be able to hand it off in a state that's um, healthy and uh, in balance. We also need to model some of that healthy balance <laughs> to our family. And I would suggest many other vegetable farmers may agree that the intensity of vegetable farming um, as you move through time in your life as your family needs change um, definitely we're going to at least begin to think about some of the less intensive uh, forms of being here on the on the farm which do include the livestock and the perennials so I do hope that we get to balance in a different way over the next seven years or decade um, and through each yeah stage of our life and generation of the farm that's it, it's meant to change over time um, and so I'm excited about that I don't know exactly what it's going to look like but um, I would say that the water and the heat etc of this year have been uh, real signposts in that direction of uh, you know uh, making sure we're working within the bounds of what's here. Mm. Awesome. So final thoughts. Um, does anyone have any, any questions or want to continue on any of the previous questions maybe? Um, Delisa, if you wanna add anything to what was talked about previously. No, I got distracted by the chat. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All good. Um, thanks, Sarah, for, for popping that information in the chat. If you have any more information on that um, or some sort of like link to that, um, I'm sure that would be much appreciated as well. Um, these questions from previously about the percentage of organic matter, um, what, have those been answered? Sorry, the chat's been going and I... Oh, I didn't see that one. Percentage organic matter, where's that? Yeah, uh, up top, Sarah asked, what is the percentage of organic matter in your soil? Has it gone up? Do you have to use more inputs or less over the time you've been farming? I don't see the question, but... I'll, I'm just gonna, I'll copy and paste it back. So it's like the bottom again okay thanks yeah um but generally speaking our soils are eight to nine percent organic matter and um we haven't seen it um very much beyond those numbers in the time that we've been here um there are I do see a trend in, in lower inputs on the, the, the phosphorus side, which is what we would expect. Um, we're kind of keeping up our routine on the calcium or the limestone just to manage the soils that are um, uh, otherwise very acidic for the cultivated vegetables. Um, but I haven't tested the soils in the um, in the pastures in the livestock areas, and I believe that um, the plans are to do that beginning this next spring. Um, so we'll start to monitor what that looks like as well. So that is a that is a great question, and uh, as an organic farmer, I mean that's really I think one of the first times I I met Art Baumke, who was also my academic supervisor at UBC. Um, I said that from my perspective, the percentage 
organic matter and how that moves is basically the report card of an organic grower, or especially an organic vegetable grower. So I think it's a great question. <laughs> Thanks. And um, I can see here Ray and Laura are asking, what are your marketing channels? Um, farmers Market, CSA? Yes, both. Hmm. And the, the bit of wholesale as well. Um, we wholesale um, when we can and where we can and focus that on Vancouver Island. Do you, um, is one, one channel like greater than the others or is everything pretty equal or what is that? It's, it's moved around a little bit over the last few years. And I think I mentioned in one of the sections. So last year we saw our CSA percentage go up a bit and the wholesale come down a bit. And that's just in response to um, the increased demand that we've seen under the COVID um, changes. That, that's true for this year as well. Um, but mm, let's say farmer's market 40, CSA, mm, CSA and wholesale maybe Maybe there's about 5% more CSA than wholesale this year. I, I haven't done that accounting yet, but that's what it's, I think it's going to look like, something like that. Awesome. Um, and Natasha's wondering, do you use mulch? Um, wondering what kind of mulch Natasha means. There's lots of different kinds. Um, and so we use some mulch um, and you after all that tirade and rant about plastics, one of the key mulches that we use is called black plastic mulch um, <laughs> in the vegetable field. Um, I would like to have a source of some really nice barley straw. I haven't found it yet. I will use that in the perennial systems. Um, we use crop residues to an extent for mulch in the alleys, but uh, not comprehensively. Um, hmm. so our, I don't know that we'll shift our slaughter procedures, but I am very actively in the process of, um, I just yesterday did the search on the farm gate slaughter um, and the new farm gate licenses. I would love to find um, a greater diversity, a greater, a larger set of resources for that. And, um, to look into that. Um, I don't have the knowledge and skills to do the slaughter that we would need to do mulch that adds organic matter. Mm, that would be the crop residues. Mm. What brand? <laughs> okay. Um, I'll type that in. <laughs> Thanks. Does anyone uh, want to unmute themselves and ask a question? I know there's lots coming into the chat, but um, as we're sort of slowly wrapping up, I know we have like a few minutes left here, which it is a bummer because I feel like this topic, it, um, it, there's so much that, that we could be talking about and I'm sure we could go on for another couple of hours, but uh, we will start winding down in a few minutes. So if anyone has any last um last questions feel free to unmute yourself and ask away or put them in the chat i can ask them oh <laughs> i misspelled biodegradable <laughs> If nobody has any questions, can I just say how great it is to see everyone? Thank you for coming. There you are, Art. It's so great to see you even in the gallery. Hannah and Mel, you're, oh, Sarah's there. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Hannah and Mel, camera off. I know you're out there. Uh, John and Aaron, and I'm sure there's others, uh, but I'm, I'm, it's, it's great to see you all. I miss you very much. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs>
Is that your rentable in the background? Um. Um. Yeah. If uh, if no one has any any last questions or I don't know, Delisa, do you have any like final thoughts that you want to leave us on? Um, any sort of like last wisdom to send Ooh, us on? No, my wisdom <laughs> was, tapped, was tapped when you got there. Are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> I would just love to hear from anyone else. <laughs> And, and oh. thanks to all thanks to all who did ask questions and 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 chimed in and shared um this zoom platform can be really challenging but it is exciting to see those faces thank you yeah yeah for sure i know um everybody is zoomed out i know i i am zoomed out so um yeah we can um well we can just start to wrap it up now and and i do want to thank uh everyone who joined this webinar and who continues to join our online events. Um, Talisa, thank you so much for joining us, um, for sharing your knowledge with us and your experience. And again, for having me on the farm, um, showing me around, uh, having a camera in your face for a couple of hours. Uh, we really, we really appreciate it. Um, in the future, we are hoping to plan for field days on the farm in person. So exciting. I'm getting excited even just thinking about it. Um, so, so maybe we'll get to do something like this in person on the island next year. I think that would be really awesome. So from, we're going to plan for it and hopefully nothing gets in our way. Um, I'm going to be sending out a participant survey uh, it would be really awesome to get feedback from everyone. Um, it's always great to hear what you liked, what you didn't like, um, what would be a really great topic for the future. I especially love hearing what, what topics you, you guys would like to um, focus on. It really helps inform, um, yeah, like the farmers that we reach out to, 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 to show us around the farm and, and the things that we talk about. So um, please let us know. Um, and this is all being recorded and it will be uploaded on our website shortly. And then um, we also have more events coming up. So I will include those links in, a, in the follow-up email along with like all of the other stuff I just said. Um, so again, thanks so much to everyone who joined and I hope you all enjoy the rest of your week and your weekend. Thank you. See ya. Bye Art. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.